just to give you a sense of the overall session we're looking at, we're going to do a little bit of quick work on looking at why focus on stories rooted in some of the work you've done already. Then we're going to focus quite a bit on most significant change as a method, sort of why you'd use it, what the key stages are, examples of where it's been used, and also some of the questions with this method, which some of you may reflect are similar challenges that you've experienced looking at stories yourself. We're going to do a practice exercise and the idea there being it just gets you all in the headspace of trying to apply this method and sort of will help you look at some of the pros and cons of it and do a bit of reflection at the end. So the first thing we want to do is spend a little bit of time just in small breakout groups. We're going to put you in groups of three for about four, five minutes. And we really want you to just talk about your own experience of, you, of gathering stories or where stories fit into your work and what you see as the value of stories, but also um, what are the challenges. Um, so really just a quick buzz with a few of you um, to, to share what you know and what you've kind of experienced already around stories. Um, so I'm going to ask Jem to sort of pop you into those buzz groups shortly. We'll just have four minutes to sort of share your thoughts and we'll have a little bit of feedback when we come back. There you go. Um, good just to get wet everyone's appetite really and start the sort of conversation going. Um, so does anyone just want to um, share something that came up in their, their group around the value or the challenges of stories? Feel free to stick your hand up, open your mic. Give us a, a sense. Rob, shall I, I go first and just bring yeah, in Hannah? Please do. I feel bad. She was mid flow and then like we were cut up, came straight back. So, <laughs> Hannah, Hannah Wood, did you want to just finish what, what you were saying in my group? Because I was just actually interested in what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was saying that I think there's a huge value in story, obviously, stories, obviously, in terms of evaluation, but also as a kind of powerful tool for. for communities themselves the people telling their stories so being able to kind of have a voice um, and then that and being able to kind of talk through that um, with Nina my colleague who who leads on on this work so I think obviously there's there's the kind of the change that stories can make hearing people's first hand kind of accounts the different things make to them but also the value that the story has to the person as an individual that kind of narrative I think is really important. Thanks Anna and Kev. Any anyone else from any of the other groups want to sort of feed in an insight that came up in their discussion? I think from our group, every everybody kind of said that we've been using stories for you know from them for a lot of time, and we all see the value of it, and that this I think is just kind of layering some of the technique maybe on top of it that we can we can all use. Thanks, Esther. Anyone else? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, in our group we were talking about how the individual stories is a bit simpler, but actually bringing that together to tell a story is the bit where it's quite challenging and more complex. Yeah, and we'd we talked a little bit about that. It tends to be a focus on individual stories or practical examples, but yeah, that kind of what's more important, how to weave it all together. Thanks, Sarah. Any other any other insights, things that bubbled up? Um, uh, in, oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Oh, you go on, Rob, for your feedback. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, in our group, we were talking about how it was a good way to articulate the richness of the work and engage with a different audience. Thanks, Rob. And Nina? Um, yeah, I was also in um, Rob's group. We were talking about, yeah, how it adds um, that kind of individual understanding. Um, um, but we were talking about um, in terms of challenges that people often don't see themselves as confident storytellers um, and understanding kind of um, that it's kind of being that positive experience for the teller um, and that they're getting something out of it, that it's not something that we're taking from them. Yeah, not kind of extractive. Great. Well, Great. Thanks, well thanks everyone for those initial insights. I'm going to, um, you won't be surprised to see some of these themes um, emerging and appearing in in the uh, narrative that I'm unfolding around my significant change. Just let me find my. <clears throat> am I back with the slides? I am. I hate not being able to see anyone, but I haven't worked out to d how to do two screens yet. So um, do as I go through, do pop things in the chat. Um, 
other members of the NELP team will sort of try and pick those up and I will there will be room to sort of come back on this at the end so I just want to sort of whistle through some things around storytelling and most significant change so building on that conversation we've just had there's sort of a number of if you like sort of common um, observations about stories that have been made and some of them kind of these reflect what you've already said so I think People like stories because they can allow people to give their own account of what's important to them and, and say why. But often people are quite comfortable and familiar with telling stories um, rather than it being scared by the formalities of research. It can come quite naturally to some people. Um, and it can also say that, you know, people's opinions are important as well. It's not only for the sort of professional researchers. The other thing is stories seem simple, but actually they can say an enormous amount in a concise and memorable way. And this is sort of a blessing and a curse about stories, but certainly they can tackle complexity in a way that's sort of um, kind of really helpful. And some of the challenges, um, often stories are perceived as just anecdotal evidence. Uh, many of you will have heard of that just being employed when it comes to stories. But there are also issues around which stories stick, which stories don't get told, which ones bubble to the surface. And a lot of these issues um, come into focus around how to be systematic. when you're looking at stories, you know, how to know which ones to tell, that kind of thing. And in many ways, the developers of the most significant change method, um, this was one of the issues they were really interested in, was how to use stories and the benefits of them, but me, be more systematic. Um, and one of the, it's been sort of described in many different ways over the sort of 20 or so years since the method was developed. One of them is monitoring without indicators. This idea that you don't have to have preset indicators and it, but you can still do evaluation and still look at impact. It's often called stories of impact because the focus of the method overall is on looking at changes that have happened, so impacts. Um, and it's kind of increasingly used, it's been used a lot in the international development sector, but it's increasingly used in the public sector in the UK now. And as an overall method, um, the idea is to use stories to identify impacts often of projects and or interventions. And the attempt to be systematic means that stakeholders are involved in deciding what kinds of change to record, um, but they also collect stories regu regularly and in a rigorous way, in a sort of consistent way, that then these stories become subject of collective analysis and discussion. Um, and the method more or less uses a way of sharing stories up and down an organisational chain, um, Save the Children, for example, use these stories to sort of gather stories at their field office level, filter them all the way up to the sort of um, central offices um, in London and then back down again. And so in some ways it can be used right across the sort of hierarchies within an organisation, but it's often not used that way. It's often used just to allow people to tell their stories and to do some sort of collective analysis. When is it useful to look at stories of change? Well, there's a number of things that have become more and more clear over the time the method's been used. When, when it's difficult to predict what's going to happen in advance, you know, we're often asked to look at indicators, but sometimes it's not really clear what it is that's important when you set out. There may be disagreement on which outcomes are really important to look at. There may be different outcomes for different groups of people. Um, when people are uncomfortable with more formal research methods that can appear intrusive, it can be a way of helping them to sort of tell their story and relax and be part of that process. When there's interest in making sure local experience and values come out. And importantly, the method allows you to explore how and why things happen. Even though the methodology was developed to look at stories of impact, um, a different framing of impact is to understand the how and why, not just whether things have happened, but the how and why. Equally, if there's no baseline, but you want to explore impact, these story, this story method has been found very useful. It can help tracking unexpected or emergent changes. And importantly, there's a space created for participants to reflect and make sense of complex change themselves, do that collaboratively. But it also surfaces differences about what counts as success and underpinning those, the sort of values behind those judgments about what is success. And if done well, it can strengthen sort of dialogue and communication processes within and between organisations. And for those of you obviously looking at place-based and whole systems approaches, this ability to look at complexity and to try and make sense of it is something that makes the kind of a, a method, a kind of natural 
um, well, a useful kind of complement to what you're doing already in those areas. So in terms of the kind of method as it's set out and designed, and I'll share a number of resources around it um, in this presentation, but afterwards, there are several key parts to it, really. One is deciding what are the changes that you want to track and look at. And if they're not indicators, there may well be areas of change, what is often called domains in the methodology. Um, then there's a process of gathering stories and a set of related questions, and then a, a, a process of selecting and analysing those stories. And I'll say a little bit about each of those in turn. So this idea of domains or areas of change that are of your interest um, is something that can be worked out with people in a participatory process, and it can be more or less informed by the kind of important areas that an organisation wants to pursue itself. So you can actually leave the domains open. You can gather stories about asking people what's a significant change, an important change in the last few months. That itself will generate a sense of things that are important to people. And over time, you can home in on those areas, look at them more systematically. Um, you can also include a lessons learned domain if you've decided to pin a few domains down. Um, you can keep one open because one of the challenges is often that people don't like to tell negative stories and lessons learned is often a nice way of looking at framing that a little bit differently. Using the method mainly three or five, three to five domains is the optimum, otherwise things can get a bit confusing. And you can look at stories about impact in the words of people on the ground, but you can also look at um, stories for project staff who might be looking at ways of working or what's made a difference to how they've been able to do their work. So you can apply it in a number of different ways. And a bit like the, the email I shared with you in advance in preparation for the meeting, the stories are generated by a, a fairly focused question, which really is about significant or important changes that have taken pay, place over a recent period of time. And you tend to ask people this question and they'll tell a story for a few minutes important to gather the why you know why is this story important what is it telling us about what makes a difference and getting the storyteller's own version of that is really really key as they tell the story often it's important to pull out contextual details who was involved where did it happen that kind of thing and importantly it's got to be a concrete change something that actually happened you'll many of you'll know that if you talk about general stories you tend to get to the what everyone thinks should have happened or they'd like to have happened the important thing is to look at real concrete changes so that you can really start to understand what's gone on and what's made a difference. And it's quite important if you can to stick with people's own words and phrases because they can often be really key and home in on important issues that aren't always apparent immediately until you've done the analysis together. And then in terms of doing joint analysis, um, someone's told a story and often this is in a setting in a community centre and a lot of the work I've done with nurture development which is reflected in some of the examples I'll I'll share is people in a community centre setting who are just sat down with a cup of tea and they're just talking telling stories to each other and it's sort of gently facilitated but importantly group discussion and actually unpacking the stories can be really really important so it can be someone tells a story and that sparks off with somebody else something similar or slightly different obviously not to undermine the person who's told that story but maybe to add layers of meaning and understanding and you can also when you've gathered a number of stories look step them back and look at those stories for commonalities and differences there's a variety of ways that you can do it depending on the the, your, the needs of your work and, and the sort of setting in which you're working very important to document this as well as you can um, getting participants to name their story can also help you home in on what it is that's really key to the story because often it's three or four stories in one. And then there's a question about selection. Um, I mentioned with the kind of introductory slide about the method, this tendency to gather stories and pass them up an organisation. And that's how it was originally conceived with, I think, the good intention that the values um, and what matters gets clarified between those layers of organisations as you go. But the truth also is that many times that doesn't really happen very effectively because it's quite a resource um, intensive process. Also because organisations can tend towards that extractive process that um, I think it was Nina mentioned earlier. So there's a there's a tendency to to sort of not do that well. But more positively, um, often 
groups decide that they don't want to say what's the most important story and select one out of the six or seven that have been shared because they all tell really important stories about what's important and sometimes the dynamic is much more well let's look at all the things that are important to everybody and then when you've got a body of stories you can do secondary analysis look at what's come up a lot try and look at commonalities and differences I've mentioned so that just to make clear that there's a number of different ways of doing this um, and I won't go into that story collection process, but you'll see that there's a number of questions to ask. You know, who's going to collect the stories? How do they do it? How often do they do it? Who's going to do the analysis? There's a lot of questions related to the method, which really come down to good design and fitting it to the process that works for your organization and your setting. So quickly to loop to some of the concerns, um, and these have emerged through kind of using the method over many years, um, and, and the, the authors and people using the method want to just be sensitized to these and try and deal with them where they can like many things you can't always find the answer but they're, they're good to be aware of so well-written stories can have more power and influence we all kind of know this from our everyday lives if something's really evocative it kind of naturally just bubbles to the surface and you know that may not be the most important story but it has an appeal for people the tendency to only report positive stories you'll all be familiar with and I mentioned that the lessons learned domain, you could even actively look for negative stories. You'd have to creatively look at how you deal with that. And it's a problem with many evaluation and research methods. That process of sort of selection of the stories, as I said, is not straightforward and it really needs good planning based on the, the relationships that you're developing with people and, and how you want it to work. There's an issue about <clears throat> significant change for who. Um, and as I described earlier, when, when I've done this work at a community level and you don't really say one story is more important than the other, it's a really nice way of validating people's experience and starting to get them to reflect on it and explore it together. When it's done up and down organisational hierarchies, there's always that danger that certain stories which appeal to the more powerful in the organisation are the ones that get put forward. So again, power, like many issues in evaluation, you have to be aware of. Um, there's the balancing the learning and the reporting agenda. The stories really can help you learn about what's going on. Um, getting them to be useful in reporting and providing that bigger picture usually needs another little bit of um, consideration of analysis of how it links to the other monitoring and evaluation that you're doing. I've mentioned that up and down doesn't always happen. Um, where, where it is the aim, I think feeding back stories so that people on the ground here what people in head office think is a vital part of that process and as I say that doesn't always get done may not be so relevant depending on how you want to use the method other concerns it's not a standalone technique it needs to be complementary with other monitoring and evaluation that word triangulation you'll all be familiar with making sure that you use a number of converging sources of data um, to sort of make your conclusions like any participatory m and &E, it takes time and resources um, it can be done with more or less rigor. But I think important also to acknowledge that as a method, it's very congruent with the kind of work you're doing in whole systems approaches. It's about building relationships. It's about listening and respecting people's experience. So in that way, that time may be well invested and well spent. And then there's the issue of the sort of perceived legitimacy of the, legitimacy of the approach. When it was an originated, um, because it was stories and there were no indicators it was seen as a little bit mm, people weren't so sure about it it's come to take on a much bigger role in international development and increasingly in the uk i think because people recognize with complexity and um, that stories can give you a way to access that but also the importance of hearing people's own voices is, is become much more and more important um i won't labor these but they're in the slides for your reference later um, a, f a number of examples. The one at the top is is a variety that I've been involved in where some of these illustrations come from in the UK, but it's been used for a lot of different things internationally, quite a wide range. Um, and if you look the the second to last bullet, um, the monitoring and evaluation news website uh, put together by Rick Davis, who's one of the originators of the method, has a long list of resources and examples that you can can uh, look into, including links to a, a software database that can allow you to gather quite a large number of stories and makes the selection and the analysis much easier should you want to do that at scale. And then just to briefly give a little tangible example, I was involved in this work with Nurture Development in London 
um, basically talking with community members about their own attempts to organise what they were calling community building for sort of well-being. Um, and in each case, someone would tell a story and it would be rendered into a kind of short comic strip, um, as this example shows you. Uh, but as well as the comic strip, you would get the story in their own words, which you can see on the left. Um, some of the key things that came out of the group discussions and analysis about what this story was saying about what was important, in this case, about building a welcoming community. And we also gathered practical ideas because this was a kind of a report used by the community to sort of galvanise interest, to explain their work to other community members, but also to look at practical hints and tips as they went forward. So that's I've thrown a lot at you and it's a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I wanted to sort of try and give you an overall flavour of the method. Um, and we've got a bit of time if people have specific questions or things they want to pick up there before we'll go into doing an exercise. So happy to sort of pick up anything that, that anyone wants to raise or reflect. And I haven't looked at the chat there, so I don't know if there are any. Um, I was Rob, just say if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat, we're happy to happy to read them out as well. If you want, to, if you yeah, Rob, Rob, I'll just kick things off a little bit. I, I've yep. posted something in in the chat, and you've already kind of as just as I was writing it, funnily enough, you were talking about it <coughs> about that uh, that that question of validity or reliability, and you know the things that we cough quite often deal with, like you know some someone sees this is a story. But how credible is it versus this idea of we need to generalize and quantify and all that sort of stuff so i was just wondering from and i, I appreciate that lots of people on the call today will have lots of experiences of this but i was just wondering what your thoughts were on it and had you any any experiences of having of getting pushback from maybe people who see evidence in a specific way compared to you know this 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 approach i think it's a great question and i'm happy to reflect on that and others may want to add um, I think what I've found with the method, uh, as I mentioned it, early on in, in, in the international development sector, it was perceived as a bit, well, you know, is it generalisable, it's stories. Um, and one of the attempts to deal with that by the story, sort of um, the people who developed the method was uh, emphasising sort of secondary analysis. <clears throat> so they might gather like 300 stories. And then if you do analysis on those, you might find that an overwhelming majority of them point to a particular issue. So you've got a sense that it's quite important. But I think triangulating the stories with other uh, data and other settings is where it becomes really key. The other thing I'd say is I've, I've always been struck. If you get people in a room and they tell their stories, that just the sort of the connections and the penny dropping for many people about what's happened is just palpable. And, it, and often that really persuades people. They realize they're not getting from their traditional data a, really, a real understanding of the different things that combine to make a difference in the context and in setting. So that becomes very powerful. And often I've seen people, um, you know, really, really be sort of smile at those insights and realize the sort of value and the importance of them. Um, so that they're the two initial responses. Does anyone else want to chip in around their own? I've got Emily. Go, go, Emily. Hi, Rob. Thanks. I think it's it, I see lots of heads nodding as, as as we kind of go through this process as something that would be really valuable. Um, and, and I love that you've just kind of presented that, that it is both formative, it's like a type of evaluation for learning for everybody concerned, as well as summative. So it's, it's a real all-encompassing thing. It then leads me to say it's very, very time-consuming, right? And this is going to be lots of us kind of thinking, right, well, how do I carve the time up? And I wonder if throughout the workshop, you'll probably get there through the examples, but you could share with, you know, um, this required this many people to process it and this many hours. Because one of the things we're trying to do in our LDP is f flip that formative learning around as we're evaluating as well, because that's where things are landing and where that that learning is is occurring as well as the summative stuff and that is going to take a lot of manpower yeah undoubtedly um i'll come back onto that in a minute i've got max yeah we were just um when we were talking in the initial uh breakout groups um lucy and hannah and i were just talking about um the 
the value and, and getting that correct balance. But we were just kind of moving that discussion on to thinking about audience and, and purpose, which is obviously crucial to a, any uh, method that we're, we're using in research. But just really thinking about um, the audience that's receiving this and how, as I say, with anything, any communications got to be put in a a format where it's really tailored for that audience. So I think, you know, one story could could um, land in one way in a room full of people. And then, you know, later that week, different group of people and, um, you know, a, a different kind of way of telling that story is maybe required to make sure it resonates with people. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that from our little group. Thanks. Thanks, Max. And I think that that issue of communication is actually really key. Um, it kind of links to Emily's point about the investment of time, because where I've tended to use it most recently is with small community groups where actually what you're trying to do is build relationships and confidence anyway. So it's not just about telling the stories or the evaluation. And actually often in those settings, um, people have made posters of the stories that have gone in community centres and they've got booklets which they kind of quite proudly in a way share with friends and it kind of validates what they've done. I know that um, when it's been used in larger organisations you tend to get the filtering up of two or three really emblematic stories which can be the kind of flagship for that organisation. There, there's issues involved as you say Max at all levels I think about how you use the method like with anything um, I think it has to be thought through carefully but the, the other side to it is that they are very powerful communication tools. So the stories themselves can be a, a really powerful galvanizing um, sort of uh, communication thing that you can use. So, yeah, really interesting. Any other reflections or, or, or issues anyone wants to pick up on? I was just going to say, Rob, Jodie's popped into the chat actually. Um, it's just well, asking about your um, experiences with nurture development and how it's quite strongly linked with their uh, well Doncaster approach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's my most recent experience has been is uh, around sort of community development, really, and sort of finding a method that doesn't make people run away, um, but actually allows people to sort of share what they've done. And usually that means framing it as a celebration or something that people want to come along to anyway. But Jodie, do you want to say a little bit more about that or, or, or sort of tease out the, 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 the issue? You've mentioned your AI process. Oh, appreciative inquiry, are we? No, I'm yeah, that sorry. wrong. The, um... We've been doing the appreciative inquiry process for, for a while now and, and there's huge value in that. But I think what what we've got a bit of a gap is how we connect that into or how we connect the stories through that process into our evaluation approach. I think that's probably something we need to, to look at. And uh, I tout kind of Doncaster colleagues in, in the comments. I'd be really keen to explore that further um, with colleagues and in, in Well Doncaster as well, as well as yourself through through the an yeah and, and certainly we can talk talk separately ab about that and, and and tease out some of the bits of the experience that are relevant um i also w wanted to mention actually just that while doing work at the community level some of this was in um gloucester uh, with the barnwood trust uh, a disability organization <clears throat> what we also did quite a lot of was um stories of change with members of staff because there was a lot of subtleties around working differently which allowed them to then have a different relationship to the community members who they were gathering stories with as well and it struck me um, that a number of you are looking at ways of working um, and different ways of working within a whole systems approach and it can be quite a can be quite an interesting process to look at that reflection I think and people getting people to tell stories some people see it as a little bit um they don't like to tell stories. They see it as a little bit, a bit like doing drama or role play. Some of those things are for some people more than others, but it can be a really concise way of opening up some of those discussions. OK, any other reflections before we move into? Uh, I was just going to say, Rob, I was just yep. going to say uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, a lot of the, the work that, that I've been doing with my colleagues in Essex as well, in terms of the evaluation work there, is uh <clears throat> is is people often will talk about 
stories of change around how they've influenced the system or they've how they've started to influence certain changes or made some sort of contribution towards the system and quite often that is very much you know um, supported by a story a story of change in terms of that journey in terms of how they've got to that point so I think this is a, a really valuable approach to be able to do that. Thanks Kev and, uh, and just a final point to build on that I think the the group analysis is really, really key. That sounds like psychodynamics, isn't it? I mean, the sitting together and analysing the stories, I think, is really key because they can appear self-evident and often there's a lot more there when you when you discuss it with a kind of um, constructive group of peers. But equally, when you're looking at what is it that made a difference, that can often be self-evident in terms of ways of working with people. But it's often quite subtle things um, and they can get surfaced in the stories too. Great. Well, thanks everyone for that. What I'm going to do now is is um, set us up for. Oh, let me go back. Um, the group exercise and the idea here is hopefully some of you will have taken a bit of time to think about a story to bring to the group. Um, we're going to go through this process just because it gives you a taster really of how it all works. We won't have chance to listen to everyone's story and we won't have chance to feed everyone back. But just by virtue of mentally going through that process, I think it helps you get a sense of how it could or, or may not work. So we're going to go into four groups and there'll be a, a NELP colleague in each group to sort of help facilitate the process. We're going to have about 15 minutes, so we're hoping that two or three people should get to share their story you know, probably tell a story for two or three minutes, then importantly focus on why the story is an important story, what it's saying about what it is that makes a difference locally. And the group, encourage the group to ask questions of context, of detail, to find out a little bit more concretely about what happened and when. And often as a listener, you need those details to really start homing in on what was going on when someone's told you their sort of top line story. Um, at the end of that process, good to give them a, a name to the story if you can, if you haven't chosen one already. And when we come to the end of the breakout groups, where hopefully two or three of you might have shared one, we'll ask you to think about one that you want to maybe share back in the group when we come back together. As I say, we won't hear everyone's story, there won't be time, but it should give you a, a flavour of the process. And just to remind you, because um, the email mountain has increased in the between the times I sent this and, and today. The question was really during the last three months, what do you think was the most significant important change that took place in the lives of either people participating in the programme on the ground, um, but it can it could equally be members of staff, how they were working differently, or it can be in the lives of local people. As I said before, try and make it a concrete actual change that you're describing and telling a story about. Um, necessarily it will need to be brief. It tends to be anyway, but because of the exercise it will help tease out a bit of the context and importantly say why the story is important. And um, there'll, be a, there'll be a facilitator in there to help remind you and try and keep you to time. So let's have a go at that. And, um, and um, as ever chopped off mid-flow <laughs> in our group, but some really interesting stories. Is everyone has everyone popped back now? I'm not seeing everyone, I don't know. Yeah. I think everyone's back, Rob. Yep, great. Um, so we've got a little bit of time, obviously a lot a lot of water under the bridge in those groups and, and some really interesting stories emerging. It'd be great to just get a flavour of a couple of those uh, um, before we before we reflect also on the kind of process, if you like, or the things that it's thrown up for people in terms of getting a taster of the method. So it'd be nice before we do that kind of reflection on the methodology, just to hear back, back from some of the groups about stories that were raised. And if they if they were named, then even better. Does anyone want to share one from their group? I can share ours if I think Kev, you, you you line me up for that. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> Emily. Go for it. The floor is yours. <laughs> so uh, I shared a story of significant change, which was um, uh, um, triggered from being allowed back out in the world from COVID and getting our teams back together in person more often is a significant change. The thing surrounding that significant change was 
um, yes, being allowed back to work together. We created a new home, a new hub um, for everyone to come into as context for us is we are a complex LDP in that we have six networks in different areas and they were prior to coming back together in our new home, our new hub, we call it Lodge House, you're working somewhat in isolation in their six areas and we wanted to get everyone together to get again. We hosted a couple of events and workshops to in, in celebration and almost in a team building format to bring them together. Um, and we set up some asks of them. We call them asks. It's not like boundaries or demands or, or things like that. Just asks of them, which was please come into Taff House uh, once a week, come into our, our lodge house once a week. Uh, to work together. We set up a reflective tool system with them um, where they were partnered up with someone from another network and sometimes they might do that online or come into the space, the home space to do it. Um, that ultimately also that, that, that reflective tool we call a learning pod leads to a monthly data collection point for us in terms of our process evaluation. Um, and it's also, I think, and a couple of them are in here, might be able to say for me, um, led everyone to kind of start to rebalance their, um, the important information I forgot to mention last time as well, we work in a secondment model. <laughs> so a lot of, most of our team are seconded roles, uh, led to our secondees, our, our teams, um, of which we're talking about 20 people, and fig refiguring out the balance of their together in active future hours and work allocation versus their other role, because in COVID that was, you know, a little bit disjointed, to refigure out that balance and um, share with others the, what they're doing and ultimately has led to also some different work streams being um, replicated and evolved in other areas based on that learning. So there's lots of great modeling happening uh, and learning from each other. Think that's my short summary. Wow, that's uh, <laughs> that's a lot in there, Emily. And and for you, the nub of the change, the difference that was made would would be what is it that rebalancing that you're home, talking about? The, the home, t the time, the having the space, the location, having a physical place to show up to, um, and an ask or demand of people to use it. So you can't just put it there because it, you know, you have to create the habits of showing up. Great, thank you. And did you give it a name, your story? We didn't. We didn't get well, that. No, far, you, far you know, off. I'm not we marking were, home. It's not a problem. Just in case we you did. The, we were conscious <laughs> the 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 countdown clock come in. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So we didn't we didn't get that far, I'm afraid. But what? Just a reflection for me, really quickly, was that it was really interesting because within our breakout, we had Hannah, <clears throat> the two Hannah Wood and Hannah Taylor in there as well and between the three of us me included we were able to sort of like probe Emily a little bit about what it was about that story of change that led to these outcomes that we're starting to see um, and Emily I, I'm sure you'll agree I think you'll agree that kind of helped you to bring that to life a little bit more so having other people to help probe and sort of question a little bit um, is quite helpful for that reflection I don't know if that is fair you're nodding Emily so yeah, it became a really reflective process for me um, and just, you know, put it all into one thing to the point where I've actually just notated everything I've put down in a little ripple there going, oh, quick, capture that. <laughs> great, great. And any other group have a, a story to reflect back for us? I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, Thanks, Jodie. Go for it. Um, so it, uh, it's got not got a great name, but <coughs> this the story is called Our Board Isn't Boring. <coughs> <laughs> and it's a story about, <coughs> sorry, my the throat's just drying up now, which is great. Um, it's a story about um, our Get Doncaster Moving advisory board. And it's important to us because it, it demonstrates the, the change that's happened at board level over the last year or so and um, how that has impacted on our outcomes. So a, a bit of background is that we've had a, a board in place for a number of years uh, leading our work strategically in Doncaster. It's been previously quite a, a traditional board that looks at, you know, um, 
finances, some of the kind of operational stuff that the board traditionally do. Um, and then during the, the first COVID lockdown, um, for the first six months, we um, we paused the board, board function um, for obvious reasons. A number of members were, were you know, supporting their own organisations in the COVID response. When we started it back up again, the, the chair of our board, who is the um, portfolio holder uh, within our council structures for public health, uh, leisure and culture, um, changed the way that he he led the meetings. Um, so he, the, most of the meeting was taken up by open space, which invited board members to, to tell stories themselves about their own COVID response, both individually, but also organisationally which we felt um, oh, the other thing he did was was invite the, the team members who attended the board to, to share their own stories as well. So what we felt that did is open up an, a new level of trust, um, strengthen relationships in ways that we hadn't had an opportunity to um, previously. Um, and it brought the, the team in as, as almost equal peers or partners around the table and there was it was less transactional around the team and the board and actually we were we were all part of the same team um, and what we also did as part of that that new way of working is that the team were then invited to sharpen up the the ask of the board members so what we did is there, there were three kind of um three um ways that the team could potentially interact with the board so one might be to endorse certain decisions one would be to solve systemic challenges and the other would be to, to inform them of, of what's going on so we took um a, a solve challenge to them around social prescribing and, and the healthcare system and one of our board members who is um uh, is vice chair of the health and well-being board and he's one of the senior directors in the the doncaster ccg took on this ask and, and started to, to mentor um, myself and a number of other colleagues and, and to help navigate the, the health system, particularly around social prescribing. So what that's allowed us to do is connect a number of, of um, projects. So we've, we've got um, green and blue social prescribing project led by the ICS. We've got um, an active travel um, social prescribing feasibility study going ahead as well as another mental health social prescribing programme that, that's looking at physical activity. And those that are involved in social prescribing know it's really hard to join the dots to work out who's who, who the influencers are, how we might join it all up and then also connecting the community voice. And his influence has helped us get around the table um, alongside the, the commissioner or the lead commissioners for the, for the model. Um, so we're actually now involved as a result of that in the, the review of the social prescribing approach in Doncaster as peers alongside some of those senior leaders making those decisions. So we can now lever and work out where we, we can lever physical activity and into that into that model of, as a result. And I suppose that's where the story ends at, at the moment. Um, what next is is doing the work and doing doing the doing to, to make sure that that then is embedded over the next six months. Um, so yeah, I suppose a bit of an abrupt end, but but where next is 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 getting our hands hands dirty and actually bringing some of those projects to life through through the project work. A case of to be continued, I think, rather than yeah. an abrupt end. But and and so to get to the nub of that story for you, Jody, that was that about just getting more out of the board, the relationships, the and what what would you say was the the nub of it for you? So that, I think it is getting more out of the board, um, how we work with the board and how the board works together as, as a group, but also how the board is using their, their wider networks and, and connections to, to further our, our work um, with, with the pilot and, and the Get Doncaster Moving strategy. So for me, it was, it was a, a real focus on the impact of those strategic relationships as a, as a result of changing how we, how we work together. Thanks, Jody. That's great. So just to slightly shift now, I know there will be a lot more stories to share, but we're, we're, we're sort of short on time as ever in these sessions. So I just wanted to shift into sort of more overall reflections on the process, really, and what came up in the groups. Um, if there's any reflections on that, um, challenges, things that people liked, whatever. 
feel free to sort of raise your hand or, or open your mic and chip in. Sorry, I'm going to put I'm going to put Laura not on the spot, but we're, well, I'll describe what we spoke about. But I think Laura made a fantastic point in our group about how it's brilliant how stories don't have to fit into a box. In research, we we speak about how you know we have to show impact and change against specific things, whereas stories can go any way we like. And also, she just made a brilliant point, and I wrote a case study about this in a, for a different project. But what? how case studies and storytelling actually just grabs you emotionally sometimes um because you can kind of relate to that person if, if, especially if it's an upsetting story and, and, and not upsetting story but a, a, a story of just that really just kind of grabs your emotions really and i think that's um i just want to say yeah laura made that a brilliant point around that and and really that that's the power of, of telling stories and, and storytelling and qualitative research thanks robbie Laura, I'll, please I'll, chip I'll, in. Yeah, no, Robbie did a great job, but I think there was something, it came from a reflection of some, from someone in the group around listening to a story and it making them cry. And what I was trying to get across and is that there's something just a little bit elusive about those really great stories and this, uh, that speaks to the emotional side of our work and I guess bringing your whole self to this work and there's something that's just not quite pin downable if I'll put it like that <laughs> um, but actually something that speaks to you on a, on a more emotional level and actually that's when you get really great stories um, so yeah it it wasn't uh, that I knew exactly what that was but just that there was something that perhaps was that you knew when you heard it whether or not it was going to be a meaningful story to to the work you were doing. Thanks Laura. Any other reflections on the the process including in fact um you know maybe from your own story gathering work um there are you know things that seem to be different in this approach or there are comparisons whatever sarah please go ahead yeah i was just going to add to what everybody else has already said that for me i always have that little nagging doubt will i be able to do justice when i tell somebody else's story because it's not my story to tell it's not necessarily the provider's story to tell, it's actually the participant's story to tell. So it comes with a level of responsibility, I guess. Just an observation. Thanks, Sarah. And I think before I go to a couple of others, I think that's a really, really key issue, actually, because we found in our group that we were in a way conveying a sort of secondhand story. Um, in some settings, you'd be hearing somebody's story firsthand, and that does allow you a bit like um, Emily and Kev's group to sort of probe a bit more. And it's often in that probing that you really uncover the really important details of context, which you can't really do with a secondhand story. That's one of the challenges. But also the ethical questions are there as well. In, in some of the work in Gloucester I did, many of the staff were really unhappy with telling other people's stories felt that it wasn't necessarily ethical and so they they would be happy to work with people to tell their own stories but realized there were so many overlaps between the staff working with community members and the stories they were relaying so i think you put your finger on some quite big challenges there um, i've got kev next yeah i was just uh, thanks rob and thanks sarah i was just wanted to build on what sarah said which i think is fantastic in that you know <clears throat> the stories are quite often that we tell are other people's stories which is important um, but just reflecting in terms of my role as an evaluator as well um, in terms of what we're doing in Essex but also I'm evaluating an ABCD program in East Sussex at the moment which isn't necessarily about physical activity it's about the whole essence of community development really in ABCD is that <clears throat> we are trying to encourage people within the community to start to develop stories around their journeys around the things that they've done and how they've navigated spaces and how they've taken more ownership of things like ABCD you know the idea of an inside out approach for example and some of the things that they're doing with that as well is they're they're using things like photography um, and other imagery for example to bring that to life and that's where I think things like photo voice which is another you know evaluation method that's out there kind of can sit quite nicely with with stories of change because photos and imagery and all those sorts of things can help illustrate those journeys so I just wanted to 
just build on Sarah's point really and and and, and say that you know evidence is everywhere um, and it can also be really efficient to start to capture the evidence coming from the very communities that we're working with as well. Thanks Kev. Any other reflections or, or things that emerged in the in the groups? I mean, I just wanted to relay one thing that came up in our group that um, the other Sarah, Sarah Leonardi, Kate pointed out was that um, we had a story. Let me find the title because it was a lovely title. Never too late to get moving, which is about um, an Asian woman at 60 getting into cycling and becoming a role model. Um, but one of the key parts of that story when we probed was that she'd been referred through social prescribing to the um, to to the intervention, if you like, to get to get a bike and get moving. But what that then revealed, as Sarah pointed out, was that actually you would want to know a little bit more about that social prescribing and why where it works and where it doesn't work. Because in some cases, people need accompaniment to get to a meeting or to get to a particular event and and just being told that they can go there by a doctor doesn't isn't the full story. So what it revealed is as these stories unfold, you can iteratively explore other aspects of the story. Um, and you can do that with other groups of people or you can do it over time. And so it allows you to sort of, in a way, do that iterative exploration as well. Any other reflections? OK, well, we're, we're sort of quite short on time. And the next thing to look at really is is what we might do next with stories. Um, and one of the things that we can consider doing is if people are interested in developing the methodology as part of their work, um, we can look at maybe doing a session around planning that, you know, doing that together to look at how it might fit into your work in quite a concrete way. But I'm also aware that that teams are using quite different story methods, um, which others may want to hear about. So we could equally do a session which could be quite rich, looking at what you're doing already with stories, um, how you've worked with it so far, um, and lessons that we can share across those experiences. Um, so open to sort of suggestion on that. What I wanted to do just briefly um, is I'm going to ask Jem to um, put a link. I don't know whether you've got it in front of you, Jem, the link for the Mentimeter poll. Um, I'm going to ask Jem to put that in the chat. and. If you can all individually cl click on that link, it will take you in another window to a two question survey, survey, Mentimeter poll. It's a little bit slow, so when you click on it, it may take a bit of time to come up. Um, so don't don't be kind of uh, frazzled by it and click it too many times. Just give it a little time to kick in. Um, so it's just really two questions to look at how we take these sessions forward. So if you don't mind all going to that link in the chat, if you can access it, as many as of you who can and have a vote on those two questions. Um, I'll give you a minute or a couple of minutes to do that and then we'll look at the results and then we can just maybe pick up on that theme of of what we do next. Oh, Emily, go, go ahead. Hi, sorry, something has just popped into my head. Um, is anybody else thinking about this in terms of their communications and marketing and how that layers together? Not a question that needs answering now, but I'm all going, well, you know, I need to think about maybe how this is, maybe I work more collaboratively with them on things like this. Because they're, and our team, our comms guys are trying to get storytelling happening for their purposes right now. And while people are filling in the the survey, I think that's a really key thing, actually, Emily. And it's it's something that can be very, very powerful. The use of the stories, but it but sort of factoring it into a communications plan, seeing where it does fit, what kind of outputs you might want to link to the stories. I think could be something worth discussing in a sort of planning session, or you know, either. In fact, um, so I'm hoping everyone has had chance to to answer the poll i don't know whether jem can you now put the if you can put the results screen up and then share your screen we can just get a bit of a glimpse of of how that's looking not the be on all and end all and we will we are going to do a little survey after this just to get your feedback on the session but equally importantly to sort of think about planning forward um because we want to sort of get the most out of this and it seems like there's a lot of experience we can share 
that's a good uh, link, Rob, as well. So I noticed Naomi had put a comment in the, the chat about interested in feedback loops for stories uh, and how people uncover and own their own stories. So I think these kind of comments we can collect up and um, incorporate into the, the feedback and then look at, at what comes next, what the next steps are. Brilliant. Thanks, Max. Um, don't know whether that's going to come up. Jim, or even if, as I said, we can use the, the poll. Okay, so they're quite an interest in actually just learning from each other. Um, I don't know whether we've got the, it uh, looks like I haven't set this up right because we had two questions. I don't know whether we can get access to the other one. Don't worry about that. We'll pick that up in the follow up. Um, but yeah, really great to sort of have everyone's participation in this. And I think obviously we'll talk. Um, in smaller groups about various aspects of the work going forward. Um, but I think it's it will be really nice to explore the sort of learning from peer to peer as well as anything overlaid on the particular method. So we will share a, a little survey afterwards fairly soon. Um, it's just gone in now, Rob. Sorry. Oh, has it? Yeah, yeah, just just gone in there now. So it literally would take you no longer than five minutes to do. So if anyone could, everyone could have a go at producing that would be really useful. OK, thanks, Kev. Um, with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for your participation. It's been a great, really interactive session. Um, final reflections or any any concerns or things people want to flag um, before we go? Feel free. Otherwise, well, thanks again, everyone, and thanks, team, and thanks, Jem, for navigating us through the, the horror of teams, which seems to be getting uh, smoother over time, but it's always has a few snags. And look forward to seeing everyone um, at, at meetings in due course. So have a good day, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Should do the, do the wave. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>